There's a fear that haunts many people. It's the fear of getting caught, of being found out, of being revealed. Every person who's ever told a lie and not come clean about it is afraid someone's going to find out the truth. Every person that's ever stolen something, a thief, they're wondering, is someone going to find the goods and I'm going to be found guilty? Every person who's ever committed adultery and never come clean, you know you're one text, one receipt, one friend of a friend away from being found in a compromised situation. There is a fear that many live with, and it's real. And this fear fuels guilt, and guilt is powerful. So is confession. One leads to bondage. The other leads to freedom. Today, I pray that you'll be willing to answer one simple question, and it's a hard question. Will my past haunt me forever? Now, the answer might set you free. I want to welcome you to Wellspring Church today. I'm so thrilled to have dear friends who helped us plant this church. They're back. Uh, they serve in our military, and they're here today worshiping with us. We're grateful. Some of you are new friends that have been coming a last week or two. Some of you are here for the very first time. We exist to connect people to Christ, the wellspring of life, to help you walk with Him for a lifetime and beyond. We're in a series entitled Life's Biggest Questions. We've been asking, is there any hope in life? How big is God? Uh, uh, who am I really? Um, Lots of good questions, and today we're going to look at some answers from the life of Joseph to answer this question, will my past haunt me forever? And I pray today you hear this. I pray you hear words of life and words of hope. I pray you hear the, the centrality of the good news of the gospel. And if you walked in today with any sense of guilt or shame or fear, that you are set free forever. From this day forward, you'll never hold on to that again. Jesus did not create you to live that way. He wants you to live with a future. He wants you to live forward, not be bound by your past. And so today we're going to look at people who were bound by their past. They lived with guilt for decades until God stepped in. And I believe God's stepping into your life today. I'll be unashamed to tell you that. I've been praying so deeply for you and so have others. We prayed all morning for you today that you might hear the Lord speak to you and set you free. At the heart of this is good news. You're going to hear exactly what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man or woman is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed. All things have become new. Did you hear that? Old things have passed. And if you've been holding something for so long today, man, be set free. Let the old be gone. Jesus said if you'll come to him and his faith comes to rest in your heart. You'll be made a new creation moving forward with freedom, with a future in Christ. Man, that is the good news of the gospel, and that's a great promise from God, and I hope you know that promise. If it's the first time you've ever heard it today, man, it is for you. Jesus says that to you today. Can you imagine not to be defined by your past mistakes, your failures, your fears, so many, you know this. Your self-talk in your head is not telling you the good news of the gospel. It's telling you, I'm still marked by this. Man, if people knew that, if I get found out by this, and the Lord wants to set you free from all of that. And I pray today that you will realize a change can happen in your heart instantaneously by the power of the living God that we just sung about. And I pray that you'll not miss that today. Now, the key is going to be up to you. The answer to the question, will my past haunt me forever, is up to you. And the key is simply admitting, I was wrong. I did fail. I messed up. And you're going to hear God's greatest grace comes at the moment when we are willing to confess and repent. Because there is power in guilt. There is greater power in confession. So would you turn with me to Genesis 42? Genesis 42. We're going to look at Genesis 42 and 43, and man, it is really long, and sometimes we stand and honor God's Word. Today, it's, a, gosh, it's 80, 90 verses, so I want you to listen as I tell you the story of Joseph and his brothers found in Genesis 42 and 43. This is the living Word of God in story. We know this, from Genesis 37 to Genesis 41, Joseph, at 17 years old, was betrayed by his brothers, 
And they ultimately sell him to a caravan, and he ends up in slavery in Potiphar's house. And he is faithful, and he's risen to the top, and he's betrayed by his master's wife, Potiphar's wife, and he's thrown into prison. By, he was doing the right thing, and she was lying about him. He interprets two dreams of, of the cupbearer and the baker, and they said, hey, we'll not forget you. When we stand in front of Pharaoh, we will remember you, and they forgot. At the end of Genesis 41, he's still in prison, and he's thinking, man, are my problems so big, or is God bigger? And we answered that question last week. God was at work. And today, here's what we're going to find out in Genesis 42 and 43. While Joseph is in prison, Pharaoh has two dreams. And he comes out and he interprets those dreams. And ultimately, Joseph is released out of prison and placed as the second in command of all of Egypt. He's the prime minister. He's in charge. God has elevated him. He's excellent in all that he does. And sure enough, everything that he interpreted according to Pharaoh's dream occurs. Genesis 42. There are seven years of bounty, seven years of plenty. Man, there's so much wheat and grain, crops, everything's growing. And Joseph is in charge, and he's appointed men who've appointed men. And they begin storing food for the entire known world. And for seven years, it's incredible. God gives him a wife. He has two sons. He's thriving. At the end of that seven years, exactly what he interpreted begins to happen. Famine hits the land. All of Egypt is in famine. Famine, if you're not aware of that word, means that nothing's growing and everybody's hungry. And Man, there's not anything. Famine means zilch. And so they're all struggling. But those in Egypt are getting grain. And they're being fed and they're being kept alive during the seven-year period. And two years into this, back in the land of Canaan, the land where Joseph is from, the land of his father, Jacob, the land of his brothers. There's 11 brothers back there. The father says, go to Egypt and get some grain for us. I've heard they've got grain in Egypt. I've heard the Pharaoh's got a great plan. Would you go? And 10 of his brothers come to where Joseph is second in command. You get the picture? And what we find out today is they approach, they ask for grain, they are given grain. But Joseph does not reveal himself, and he is very demanding of them. I'm going to give you grain, but here's what you must do. Don't you have another brother? I want that brother to be brought back. I want to see him before I give you more grain that's going to sustain your family. And they're wondering, why is he so abrupt? Why is he so demanding? Who is this prime minister? He says, in order for you to keep your word, I'm going to keep your brother Reuben. He places him into custody. He says, I'm going to ultimately release you to go back to your father, but you need to come back with the brother named Benjamin. And they're thinking, oh my gosh. And this leads to, they have to return without their brother Reuben. He's in prison in, in Egypt. They have to approach their father and have one of those come to Jesus conversations with their dad. This is a hard one. Dad, we kind of let you down. Man, the last time we went out, our our brother Joseph was killed, and now our brother Reuben's in prison, and they're asking us to bring Benjamin. Benjamin is the favored son of Jacob. Joseph and Benjamin had been, but Jacob thinks Joseph's dead. And so Benjamin, much to Joseph's disliking, is released and sent to Egypt because that was the command of the prime minister. Bring him back, then I'll release more grain for your family. When they get back, there's a grand banquet table waiting for them. And it's such a surprise, and a lot's going to go down at this moment. All right, that's Genesis 42, 43. Now I want you to listen as I read a signature verse. This is from the Word of God. Genesis 42, 27, 28. When they stopped for the night and one of them opened his sack, the brothers had left Egypt the first time with all the grain given the first time. They opened his sack to get grain from his donkey. He found his money in the top of his sack. Look, he says, he exclaimed to his brothers, my money has been returned. It's here in my sack. Then notice what the next part says. Then their hearts sank, trembling. They said to each other, what has God done to us? I want you to notice this. What has God done to us? That's a fascinating comment. They don't say, where did all this money come from? They don't say, there's got to be some mistake. They don't say, is someone playing a trick on us? They ask, what has God 
done to us. Hey, what's at play here? For anybody that's ever been found guilty, you know what this is. Their conscience is speaking to them. They're acknowledging God is bringing back something we did almost 25 years ago. What has God done to us? He's speaking to them about a past bad decision, about a failure, about an action, about trouble, about sin in their life. And let me acknowledge this right now. Guilt does not disappear over time. I'm going to repeat that. Guilt, guilt that is not confessed, repented, and received the forgiveness of God. Guilt does not disappear simply over time. See, if we attempt to justify or simply cope or push back in the recesses of our brain, man, I know I'm guilty. I never come clean. I hope I never got it. It'll get better. It'll be fine. I'll be able to live life. No. Guilt does not go away over time. And so freedom is what the Lord wants. He wants us to be able to live and move forward. And it's critical to get past anything in our past or anything we're holding against someone who's guilty against us. We're equally bound. So are you able to look in the mirror today and say, there's nothing hindering me from my past? Will your past haunt you forever? If it is, let it go today. And my prayer, man, is that you would be willing now in just a few minutes to just speak to the Lord and let him speak to you and let go of anything in your past that would hinder you moving forward. Well, we cannot change the past, but we can deal with it. Let me offer three things that Joseph does. Joseph deals with his past, first by taking charge of the past and the present. Joseph takes charge. He's already forgiven his brothers. Remember the story last week? He names his two sons Hebrew names. I mean, he's living in Egypt. He's got an Egyptian wife. You'd think he'd give them two Egyptian names so that they could rise to power in Egypt, but he gives them Hebrew names, Manasseh. Manasseh literally says in the scripture, God has made me forget the pain of my past. He's dealing with his past. I do not want this to bind me. And he says, thank you, God. And he names his son Manasseh. My past, God has allowed me to let go. God is allowing me to forgive. We know we might not forget how ugly something was, but we can forgive and we can be set free moving forward. And Joseph does that. The second thing says, I want the bounty of the Lord. He names his son Ephraim. It means favor. It means blessing. It means like super bounty, super blessing. So Manasseh, no past is going to keep me back. Ephraim, I am moving forward with the favor of the Lord. He deals. He takes charge of the past. Now let me remind us of this very subtle truth. This entire time of Genesis 41, 42, 43, when the brothers come, they go back, they get their brother, they come back, they have no idea who Joseph is. He never reveals. This is like he's in disguise. He's secret. Obviously, he's not wearing the Hebrew beard. He's probably wearing some kind of headdress. He's the second in command. They can't imagine a brother sold into slavery would ever be that place. So they have no idea. They think he's dead. Now, I love what Joseph does. Reminds me of the quote back in the Persian Gulf Wars. When Colin Powell, when they ask him, hey, who's in charge? He says, I am. And when in charge, take charge, and I will. And he did. He made decisions decisively. And that's exactly what Joseph did. I want you to notice his leadership. He is taking charge of the present. I Man, he is intentional. He remains discreet for a reason. He is very shrewd in the way he deals with his brothers, and he's also decisive and firm. He does not hold back. Now, some people might ask, man, I mean, what happened to all the love? Why didn't he just say, oh, my gosh, well, you guys, even though you sold me in slavery, it's all good and fine. Hey, I'm now in charge. Hey, come in. Why did he not do that? Why, did he, why was he so harsh? Why was he demanding to his brothers? Here's the reason. Joseph wanted more than just physical provision for his brothers. He wanted spiritual transformation. He wanted more than just take care of their needs in Canaan. He wanted to make sure that more than just he and his father had enough food to last for the next seven years. He wanted something to happen in them. He wanted reconciliation. Man, throughout all the years, and he's in Egypt and his rise to power. Let me remind you, he never forgot his father, the father of his youth. 
He never stopped thinking about his brothers. I mean, down deep, Joseph, although he looked Egyptian, he was Hebrew. That's who he was. That's who his faith was. He was the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Man, he longed to see his family. Man, he could have just given them food. No harm, no foul, right? No confrontation. But instead, he says, we were not going to get to transformation if I simply give them enough food and send them on their way. I've got to confront the situation. And you and I know this, and let me just urge you, let me encourage you with this. If some of you have the ability to step into tension or crisis from your past, do that. Because out of it comes potentially the greatest blessing and ministry and healing that you could ever imagine. Step in. Don't be passive. Don't just assume it's going to go away. If you sent, man, you step in and say, God, by your grace, would you help me deal with this? And that's what Joseph does. He's trusting that as he's going to step in, God is going to transform his brothers. Joseph wanted what every one of us wants. He wanted his family to be united. Man, can't we all just get along? Can't we all just get along? Hey, every child in a home prays for that, asks for that, when everybody's fighting. Man, if mom and dad are fighting, or brothers are fighting, sisters are fighting, can't we all just get along? And Joseph is asking the same thing. That's an innate desire of every person of humanity. Man, they want their family to be loving and unified. You know that. And some of you today, your greatest heart's desire is for your family to get along. That's why there's sometimes tension at Thanksgiving, Christmas. Two days that we, two days we ought to be able to stand and eat and have fun. And everybody's hug and kiss and be wonderful. It's, it lead, it's full tension. You're just thinking, well, how did we get here? What can I do about this? And you know, man, that is not what God would want. That is not God's will. That there would be tension in family. And so Joseph, at the very core of his being, he's thinking, man, have my brothers had a change of heart? Are we going to be able to get to this place where uh, there's something that's going to happen in all of our family? But he's got some questions. And so he's up front with them. And he's not letting them off easy because he's not sure what he's stepping into. Do my brothers still hate me? He's not sure. Do they care? Do they even want me in the family? They sold me once 25 years ago. Do they want me now? Will they ever own up to their betrayal? That hurt. I was 17. They disowned me. They threw me in a pit. They sold me to some foreigners. They never came back to get me. 20 years. 20 years in prison. Listening. Waiting. He didn't know the answers. Have they ever confessed? Have they ever repented? And these are hard questions. Perhaps you ask those about your circumstances. And so Joseph takes a hard stance to these hard questions. And he refuses to reveal his identity so the brothers could reveal theirs. He's holding his cards so they have to play theirs. He wanted them back in his life. But he's not sure did they want him back in theirs. So here's one of the last things. Joseph trusted God's sovereignty and the timing of God's conviction in their life. Notice quickly, Joseph was in the right place at the right time. The brothers, it was the right place, the right time for them to come clean, to recognize their sin, do something about it. Till now they'd not. Eleven years, Joseph served as a slave. Two years, he was placed in prison. He was released. There were seven years of bounty and plenty. Now we're two years into famine. That's a lot of years. And the brothers are still in denial. They're still in denial. Until they open up a sack and they ask, what is God doing to us? Hmm. Sounds a lot like the story of the prodigal son. If you're not aware, in the New Testament, Jesus tells a story of a son. He was one of two brothers. His father was very wealthy, and he came demanding to his father, I want you to give me everything that I have so that I can leave. I want to go be on my own. I want to be independent. And the father gives him his portion of the inheritance. And, boy, as the saying goes, he spent it all on wine, women, and dance. 
I mean, he just frittered all of it away until he finally ends up in a hog pit eating with the hogs. That's the only way he's surviving. And a thought comes to him and says, wonder what would happen if I were to return to my father. Would he at least let me be a servant in his care? And, and my, let me be someone to, well, my father's still the master. And so he comes to his senses because he's reached the lowest point of his life. This is this beautiful story of redemption. Man, if you've ever read it, I would tell you, Man, perhaps today you need to read it and let the Lord speak to you. Man, as he is cresting the horizon, the scripture says his father is, sees him out on the horizon and runs to him. Because his father had been looking on the horizon every day. He'd been hoping and praying, my son, Lord, would you bring him back? And very out of custom for a father. Man, he picks up his garb because he's got all these cloaks. And he starts running to his son to remind him there's redemption. And the prodigal has returned. And that's what Joseph's hoping. But he realizes, look, I can't do this for my brothers. Redemption is a work of God in the human heart. I can't do it. I cannot do it. I've got to wait. I've got to wait for them to come to their senses. So you and I know this. This is part of humanity. If we're guilty... And we're just living far and running from God. We think we're one day away from turning it around ourselves. We think, Lord, if I just have one more day, I can fix the problem. Lord, if there's just one more day, I could, I could make everybody love me and I could come back the hero. Lord, I'll get out of this pigsty. Lord, I, I, we'll be able to, to make it right with our father. We lied to him over the last 22 years about our brother. And until you get to rock bottom and you go, I got nothing there's no place to turn. Man, I am guilty as I could be. It's at that moment where confession and redemption leads to life. But until you get to that moment, let me tell you, those of us who are aching, we're like the Father looking out on the horizon. Man, we're praying for people in love, not in condemnation, not in skepticism. Here's what we need to do. We need to pray and let God deal with them. It is not our place to bring condemnation or conviction. We are not the Holy Spirit. So the best thing is just continue to pray and get out of the way. And if you watch them and they are about to hit rock bottom, let them. By the grace of God, let them. Because the best is about to happen if they do. Don't rescue. Let them hit to the bottom. So let me ask a couple of questions today for you and I as we prepare to close. Will my past haunt me forever? Perhaps you see yourself as one of these two characters. So, unless we think we're so righteous, let's start right here. What if like Joseph, man, we've been the victim of mistreatment at the hands of others. And we're sitting here today saying, I was betrayed. I was abused. I was falsely accused. I didn't get go anywhere. Other people, I helped and they were promoted and I got passed by. Man, I feel like Joseph felt. And there are days you're trying to awaken the guilty conscience of someone else. You're trying to play God. That's sin. You're trying to say, I'm going to keep this edge in my heart and in my mind until they confess and they come back on their knees. Until they do all. Stop. That is only for God. You and I cannot awaken the guilty conscience of someone. Only God can do that. So let God do it. I love what Oswald Chambers says. And I, I cannot save and sanctify myself. I cannot atone for sin. I cannot redeem the world. I cannot make right what is wrong. I cannot make pure what is impure, holy what is unholy. That is the sovereign work of God. No one can force another person to repent. We just can't. To attempt is foolish. and spiritually trying to take God's place. And we become as guilty as the guilty party because we have sin in our heart at that point. So if you're like Joseph and you've been betrayed, you've been wounded, and everyone in the room has at some point in life, Right? Everyone has. Here's what we can do. This is why Joseph is such a wonderful part. Here's what Joseph did. Remember, he trusted God and he served people. 
He trusted God. In those 22 plus years, he just kept trusting God. Cleaning floors and toilets and prison cells and doing whatever. He just kept saying, there's a God. There's a God. There's a God. I'm going to trust him. Great are you, Lord. And he was serving all the while. He didn't fall into his pity party. He was serving others. There's a God. And he bloomed where he was planted. He became fruitful. Pharaoh saw it. I need a man like that. I'm going to give him my, my daughter. I want you to have children. I want to put you in charge of all the land. He became fruitful because he trusted God and he served. He believed in the sovereign hand of God. And all the while, he waited to let God deal with those who had betrayed him and hurt him and wounded him. You and I, here's our part. Let go and move forward. Just let go. Let go. Here's the second thing. Now, what if you are like Joseph's brothers? And all of us have been here at some point in our life. What if you're like Joseph's brothers and you're so burdened today with a guilty conscience? I want to tell you today, I want you to listen very clearly, not miss the next two minutes of what I'm about to say. There is good news for you today. And it's going to be up to you to respond. But there is such good news for you today. And Christ did not come to condemn, but he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Though our sin be as scarlet, you can be as white as snow. You can be completely washed today. No matter what your past is, you can be forgiven. So come to the cross. Man, run to Jesus. Man, let him cover your guilt and your shame and your fear. Do not carry your guilt around with you. But I've said it more than once today. Here's the key. you got to admit. you got to get to that place where you go, I am not God and I'm not the Savior and I need that. I was wrong. And God, I need to be right with you. And so I want you to do that today. Man, there's some of you I love so much. I mean, I've told some of our elders, if I could just go out and just grab you, just give you salvation, I would. It's not my place. My place is to present the seed of the gospel and allow God's Holy Spirit to be at work with you. But I would tell you, the greatest thing would happen in your life and your life would move forward with the presence of God and a very relationship with your creator. And God wants that for you. I would remind you, God is more ready to forgive than you are ready to admit you need him. Man, he loves you so much. Man, if you turn, just a glimpse of turning to him, he is running to you. Man, we sing a song, it's in Christendom right now. He is willing to leave all the righteous 99 to run after one, and you are that one. He will run after you. He wants you so much. He wants you to experience salvation. He wants you to be forgiven of your past. He wants you to live in your future. Why would you turn that away? I told you today that guilt is powerful, and so is confession. Repentance is a gift. Why would you not receive that? Why would you walk away from that? God's greatest grace does come at the moment you just give up and say, oh, God. And he says, yes, you're my child. And he moves you from death to life. He changes your name from a slave, a servant, to co-heir with Jesus. You're now a child of God. Will your past haunt you forever? Well, the answer is up to you. The answer is up to you. God is ready. He's gone from eternity to eternity, to show himself to you so that you could live in the present and the promises moving forward in the future. Man, would you trust him today? Would you do business with God today? Let's pray.